Ricky Wysocki joining the show now. Ricky, how's it going, brother? Hey, good. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're having a grand old time. <laughs> this hearing Yuli talk about, were you one of the butt dials that Yuli had? No, he went <laughs> no to bed I don't early. think so. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I was telling him, Calvin, Calvin's like, why did I have four FaceTimes uh, two nights ago? <laughs> And I'm like, well, that's because the kids got a hold of my phone and they started calling everybody on my contacts list <laughs> at the <laughs> fireplace. So Just butt that's dialing funny. away. Yeah. Um, yeah, at the bonfire. How, how's it going, Rick? How was, how was your USDGC? How, how, was the inter- how was the tournament for you? It was good. I, I, um, I started off a little bit slow, uh, to be honest. I think that for me, I started off the first two days. I think I shot two five unders, which was another type around for me. It's not good, but not bad. And kind of dug myself a little bit of a hole. I think uh, that, um, you know, you really want to be shooting. If you were, want to be on pace to win, you got to shoot like seven, eight under. I think average right in that range. If you can average right around eight, I think that's always going to put you near the lead no matter what. Because there's going to be someone that pops off, shoots a 12, and then follows it up with a five or six. You know, that's kind of how it goes out there as far as the scoring goes so so i kind of shot a couple rounds that i wasn't out of it i just had to play some really good rounds which i played a really good round three to get myself in position yeah and then uh just didn't really have any momentum go my way uh the final round to really give myself any sort of chance of winning but um yeah i mean i just i was i was in contention i was made the made the lead card the final day so that was cool after um I was on the third card for the most of the tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, got to see, got to see Gannon play really well and, and, uh, and got to see that shake out. I didn't get to play with Calvin, but, um, yeah, that was cool to watch him climb up the leaderboard and give him, put himself in contention from the third card. That's always, a that's always a, a crazy dynamic going into the final round when you have someone that's not on the lead card, that's in contention from a couple cards away. Yeah. It seemed like your rounds, um, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier where like USDGC is one of those courses of where if you're playing well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You're just throwing the shots you want to throw. You're making the putts, you're moving on. There's not like a lot of decision-making. There's not a lot of spots where you're like, Ooh, which I do here. If you're throwing the disc well. Um, but if you're throwing the disc a little off, there are spots where it's like, well, that just cost me a stroke and you know, or oop, the five feet long there, that just cost me a stroke. And that's kind of like, I don't know. That kind of seemed like you didn't have that blow up hole. Like we just talked to Calvin, Calvin had a blow up hole. He took a quad, right? Like looking through it, you just had a couple bogeys throughout the rounds, round one, round two, and round four. So did it feel like you were, you did it feel like your game was just like almost there. Like you just weren't able to get over it for those three rounds. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly how it was. It was like my game was good, but just not great to the point where I felt like I should have a chance to win. And uh, like you said, a lot of times when you're off over there, it's like, it's, it's kind of weird because you're, you not only miss the shot, but now you're in an unfamiliar landing zone. You haven't thrown a shot from that distance from that. Let's say you're on a different side slope or a different, like totally different angle potentially if you threw a bad shot that you didn't practice from. So now you're throwing, you're kind of playing a guessing game as far as how, how far it's going to play. Where's, you know, how is the green going to react from that angle? So a lot of little dynamics that can throw you off and just make you feel a little bit uncomfortable and that can equal a lot of strokes. But what I did really well was, yeah, I didn't take anything higher than a bogey. I don't think all weekend, which yeah. is crazy. Maybe I, yeah, I don't think I didn't see a double in there. So yeah. So which that is very impressive. Anytime very you go through there. that course, um, and not take anything higher than a bogey. Cause th- there's a lot of holes out there that, that you can like, like Calvin said, he, he, he took an eight and that's, that can definitely happen. And he's, he's a good enough player to where he's going to get enough birdies. He can make up for that. And so that's very impressive. The fact that he did that and still shot, I think six under for that round. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, this the USD, it's such a tough balance to, to know how aggressive to be to where you, where you can win, but also how safe you want to be to where you're not taking the big number. Cause you got to be aggressive to get the birdies, but you also, you don't want to start getting punished for being hyper aggressive. And all of a sudden you run into a, eight like what happened to calvin you know so it's like it's so hard to find that tough balance and it's like some years can be you know just for what not for whatever reason because it's winthrop but some years sometimes you can win with a lot lower scores uh than you would normally think like averaging seven six seven under instead of like an eight or a nine potentially which is kind of what it took this year so yeah it's kind of like you kind of just got to see how the tournament feels how feel it out and see what um 
you know, see how really see how people are shooting. I mean, that's that's definitely a thing. Is just kind of see how see see which year you know which year it's going to be. Is it going to be a hey, I'm shoot got to shoot an eight or nine under every round, or is it like a lot of people are struggling and you got to stay away from that big number. So you got to kind of build your game plan to be able to make that adjustment on the fly. Like you got an aggressive and a go for and a layup shot on pretty much every hole for me. Yeah. What about, um, so you shoot the th- third round, thir- 13 under or 12 under 12 under, yep. 12 under. And then how tough is it to follow up a 12 under with another smoking round? Like we saw you do it in Estonia where you, where you played really, really good. And then you've, I mean, you just absolutely demolish the field. Is that something you're used to, or is that like a really tough feat is, is great round followed up with another great round? Yeah. I think it all depends on like how your game is feeling. So like as a player, obviously like if your game's feeling really good and you shoot a 12 under, it's like, Oh, I can do it again. But like, there's kind of, so there's kind of two sides to the coin. Like Mm -hmm. if your game's maybe not feeling that great and you kind of, and you maybe get a couple lucky breaks and you, you know, you're playing good, but you're not, your game doesn't feel like, you're a hundred percent like in control of every throw and every your swing and every, the, every movement you make. So there's kind of like that side of the coin where you kind of like you're throwing good, but you're not a hundred percent confident in everything. And so when you have a round, when your swings feeling like that, it's kind of like, okay, like I'm happy that I got the result that I did, but I mean, you're, there's a little bit of uncertainty still to where you're maybe not going to uh, feel like you can shoot that again. And then there's the, my game is feeling great. Everything's clicking. I shot a 12 under, I, you know, I'm going to go out there and I feel like I can do it again. No questions asked. And so, and you, in Estonia, my swing was at that point where I was like, all right, I can, I'm just going to go out there and do it again. And then like USDGC, for whatever reason, timing wasn't quite, quite exactly where I wanted it to be. So it was more of like shot a great round, got the good result. And now I got to go out there and, and try to <clears throat> try to do it again. And, and so, yeah, I think it's just as a player, you can feel where your swings at and you can feel kind of like the chances of you doing that again, or, are you know either great because you're you're in timing and rhythm with your swing or it's like uh, you're kind of fighting a couple things whether it's an early release here or there or um putt doesn't feel quite as crisp as you as it normally does so just those little things can make a big difference in your confidence and whether you you're able to shoot that 12 under again so final round you're playing and and you can if, if you watch the round you can see that at one point you i think it's whole six you miss the shot you're deflated. Like at that point, you probably know, like my chances of winning aren't very good. How do you like come back on the back nine to have a good finish in a situation like that? Cause you know, we all know to you winning is everything. Um, and then you come back and you, and you absolutely shred on the back nine. Was there like a little gr- glimmer of hope to where you're like, if I play the perfect back nine, maybe I still have a chance. Or at that point where you like, I just need to figure out or, or try to get the best finish I possibly can. Yeah. So it's always a weird transition. Whenever after the first round, I felt like I have a chance. Uh, I don't feel like I have a chance. I know I have a chance. I know that that within, you know, a handful of strokes, five strokes, I can, if I play well enough, I don't need them to really play bad. If I can just play great and, and catch up. And that's something where if you're eight or 10 strokes back, that's not really the case. You can play great and you have to rely on them, the leaders to play bad. So I was in a stage where I felt like if I played a great round, I could, I could win the thing and put some pressure on the leaders and out there at Winthrop, that's what you got to do. You got to be able to apply pressure and whoever handles those high pressure situations are going to win and kind of, you know, Calvin did that. Um, but, um, you know, I think being, being in person, like on the same card, it's a little different effect. Uh, plus Calvin had, you know, I think a couple holes on him. So, Gannon was able to kind of shift his game plan to maybe play a little safer, a little depending on how Calvin did on a, the holes down the stretch. Um, but as far as me, as I go, um, yeah, it was, you know, it got to a point, like you said, around hole six where I was like, kind of felt like I was out of it and really deflating, you know, the motions were just, you know, my vibes were, weren't very good. And then it went from snapped from that to, all right, well, I'm not going to win. It's a bummer. It took like a hole to set in and I'm like, all right, well now I just got to, just got to, just got nothing to lose. So I'm going to go out there and just try to birdie as many holes as I can and try to climb up the leaderboard and get a good finish. And, and that was what I was able to do. And I think, you know, the like holes, I think came down to like 15, 16. I think it was when I really felt like, all right, if I can, if I birdie out, I do have some sort of a chance to where yeah. I can, you know, maybe get to like 
two back going into 18 or you know or 17 or something like that and that was a potentially potential could happen yeah. um it didn't work out like that but um but yeah i mean it's it's winthrop and it didn't happen this year but i mean this is one of the first years you didn't have any crazy crazy drama down the stretch like we normally do i mean i guess calvin calvin definitely created a lot of drama with it with his round that he was pl- playing and he put the pressure on gannon to to continue a good pace to be able to take it down but um yeah i mean it's always a weird dynamic whenever you're you feel like you're mid round and you're don't have a chance to win it's 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 tough to tough pill to swallow but um yeah at this time at, you know as an athlete you want to still just grind it out and, and uh fight through some bad breaks bad you know whether it's bad breaks or bad bad swings that cause you to go out of bounds that cause you to be in that situation but um yeah everyone's fighting a different fight whether it's mentally or physically with their game um and so it's always nice to come out with a good finish and I finished top 10 in all the majors. So that's something I can be proud of. Yeah. That's really solid. Were you guys being pushed at all for time? Cause I know you were, I mean, you started, I, I, I hate how the pro tour like already starts you guys like multiple holes behind. I get it. They're trying to like avoid uh, backups, but it's like, if you did what you're supposed to do, there wouldn't be backups like heading right. into it. And I just hate, obviously you're going to play slower too with the amount of crowd control cameras have to get in position, all that. I just hate like seeing it where you guys are like four or five holes behind the card in front of you because it does lose a lot of drama of where you're yeah, like, sure. Oh, well, like we already know what Gannon has to shoot. Cause like Calvin's pretty much done versus if they were closer, it's like, there's a little bit more of like, Oh, what's going to happen. So like, were you guys being yeah. pushed at all to go faster? Um, not too much. I mean, I know there was a Marshall on the card, but I don't think they really said anything unless they said something that potentially to Gannon and not to us. Maybe they gave him a warning, but I don't know. I wasn't aware of that. So I don't, okay. I don't think that that, that happened. Um, but yeah, like you said, it does, it affects the tournament in a, in a big way because as a top professional athlete and you know what you have to do down the stretch, that's a big advantage versus, you know, versus if let's say that there wasn't that gap and he was only a, a hole ahead you couldn't quite keep up as much as far as what Calvin was doing. Um, like you said, four or five holes versus one hole, that's potentially two or three stroke swings or yeah. more in that time frame. to where, you know, it's, that's a, that's, that's, that means the world in a big tournament like this. Yeah. I think, I think it, it hurts both sides, right? It hurts the competitor side. Um, and I think it just hurts the viewing side. Cause then you end up just having four people on the call, like four people playing the last four holes, and there's no one yeah. else on the course. So it's just that I hope need, uh, that's something that I hope that pro tour addresses this off season, really figures out pace of play and gets it down. Um, hopefully. Um, all right. I want to switch a little bit here because something that you started, I don't know if you started this year, but you definitely ramped up the product, the production, or at least like more people are paying attention to it is your, are your practice rounds. And, uh, I thought this was a really good question. They, they asked what can disc golf as an industry do to expand the casual fan reach? I'm not a diehard football fan, but if there's a good game on and I'm free, I usually watch it. It seems like disc golf doesn't have an in between. You're either a diehard or you don't follow the sport at all. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. As far as the first part you said, like yeah, I've been doing a lot more content, and it has been geared toward towards the beginners, to where people can watch my practice round. They can kind of get like a a preview if they haven't seen the course before. And then also for me, I like to include a lot of tips in there, to where people can watch it and it's informative. People can watch what's going through my head and what what I what I do to work through a professional level course, which is what I'm playing every week. And so people can, they can kind of knock out two birds with one stone, watch the course, get ready. If they're a diehard fan to watch the pro tour event and learn something and take something away from my game that they can apply to their game. And, uh, and so that's kind of what I've been going for. And I guess that that targets more of the beginners, people really, really trying to get better and uh, probably potentially newbies. It doesn't have to necessarily just be that, but um, newer players that are just, you know, wanting to get in my head as far as what goes through my head with shot you know shot shaping course management swing thoughts through swing tips all that different stuff so that's kind of what i've been going uh gearing my videos towards and then and then what was the second part of the question 
So they're trying to figure out like right now, I feel like a lot of the marketing and disc golf is geared towards like the diehard fans, like the people that already yeah. know and already are watching and consuming everything. What are, what are some things, players, some things, manufacturers, some things, the pro tour, what are some things that can happen? And Yuli jump in here too. If you have anything, like what are some things that we could be doing to try to get more attention from like the you know, the, the everyday disc golfer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, a lot of people try to do the cross branding with different sports and different people. I think that, um, yeah, I think, I don't know. I think, I think a lot of people now, like you see Drew doing golf and I think he's trying to do a little bit of both, you know, trying to get the golf audience to go to disc golf and vice versa potentially. Um, so I think that's going to help. I mean, obviously the stuff like what you did with the, the ultimate, I mean, people like you help a lot with that have a, a big following in another industry that kind of like bring them over and just show them that, Hey, the disc golf's an awesome sport that like they may, they just never would have even thought about playing until someone that they followed or they liked, or they got influenced by in whatever way kind of like show open their eyes to like, Oh yeah, there's a whole nother competitive side. Like kind of what you did. Like there's a tour, there's a, like, it's a legitimate thing where they thought, you know, you know, if you're, if, if you're an outsider looking in, like they, a lot of people just think disc golf's just a bunch of hippies that throw at trees. They don't realize yeah. that there's, you know, there's a whole separate professional tour and people that take it serious. And, and within that, there's a whole fan base that support players and kind of this underground community that, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be underground, but it is right now. Mm. Um, this was a question that none of us had the answer to. So we're going to see if you we're going to, we're going to test you. What, what do you think the answer is to disc golf coverage? Um, for me personally, I think it's, uh, the answer is live coverage. That's simple answer. I, I've been saying this from the very beginning. I think we need, we just need to, um, not anything against Jomez or anything like that. They make a great product. I think there's a, still a place for it, but I think we, you know, just, uh, I've always been a sports fan and I've, I've always just been the type of person where I want to watch live. That's just, it's just, I feel the energy you feel, you feel, you kind of get, you're a part of it more emotionally when it's, when it's live, you just, feel, cause you know, all the events are happening in real time. And, um, and so just, there's nothing better than the culmination of a live event that comes down to the wire in the last second of a football, baseball, whatever game. And, um, and I think that there's a lot of that disc golf, whether the tournament ends in a playoff, like the USDGC did a couple of years ago with Kyle and Paul, like all that stuff is captured so well live. And I think that, you know, the better live product we have, the, then the, that's kind of the next step into potentially a big network saying, Hey, there's, this is a lot, there's a lot of entertainment value here and, um, for a CBS or, uh, something like that where it's not, Hey, we're airing it three months down the, down the line. It's like, no, we're going to put this on a, you know, even if it's an, you know, an off week from a potentially all the major sports and we make it live. It's not three months, you know, down the, down the line. It's, this is a live event for, from the world championships on CBS and give us that platform with a great product. And I think that, that disc golf is at a spot where it can, it can potentially, um, yeah, impress a lot of people at the big networks. What do you What do you think? I mean, you're obviously playing, so I don't know how much live you actually get to watch. Yeah, but if you do go back and ever tune into the live, yeah. um, one of the big like complaints I see often is just like the quality of the coverage isn't great. Uh, the storytelling, yeah. they're kind of all over the place. They kind of sometimes just like, will cut straight to a shot without giving you kind of any, uh, context of what's happening. Like the coverage as a, as a whole, isn't that great. And I, my, my thought is like, if it was free, I don't think there would be as many complaints, but because it's behind a paywall, because people are paying for it, when you yeah. pay for something, you kind of expect a, a certain yeah. product. I, I see that. And I, the kind of my stance on it is like, there's no, there's no event that you're ever going to go to, whether it's a concert or a, 
um, uh, anything like you're going to go snowboarding. You're going to go, you're going to pay for it. You're going to go to a concert. You're going to go to any sporting event. So any sort of entertainment that you, that you attend in, whether it's in person or watching on TV, you're paying for it in some way or another. So it's like, plus it like people feel invested. Once you pay for something, it's kind of cool. Like, Oh, I'm going to go to the local disc golf tournament, but you got to pay for it. You're like, you know, or you're like people plan out a concert a couple months in advance. They pay for their tickets. So there's monetary value. It kind of like creates this excitement. Like, Oh, I had to pay $200 to go see, you know, post Malone or whoever it is. So there's that draw when it comes to the monetary value. But yeah, like you said, the live has to get better. I totally fully agree on that. I do. I do think that if, and when the live product is, is, um, is perfected, which is obviously a hard thing to do. And it takes a lot of money. And I don't yeah. know what the solution is that, um, the disc golf is fun enough to watch as a, if you can capture it and, and everything. And like you said, tell the stories, there's a whole, there's a whole side of disc golf that really hasn't get gotten tapped into. Like you said, it's creating these kind of storylines between the players and, and all those different dynamics going on that aren't, aren't really getting that those pictures aren't really getting painted right now. And, and so, yeah, these people are paying for the coverage and they're just kind of like, ah, like, yeah, it's, it's constantly buffering and you know, the, the quality's not there. You know, the cameras, you know, sometimes the cameras are literally pointing at the ground when they yeah, should be, when they're, they should be pointing, like showing the cool shot that, that's happening. So you know, there's a lot of hiccups and, you know, I think that, you know, it does come to a point where you're like, all right, well, it's been long enough. They should, should have been able to figure a lot of this stuff out by now. So it's kind of like a double edged sword. Like, when is it going to happen? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hope they figure it out. Um, because I know it definitely has drawn a lot of people away from watching it because like you said, you know, you kind of are like, all right, I'll I'll give them, I'll give them a chance to figure it out. But at a certain point you're kind of like, bro, I've I've been paying for this for 16 months and it's the same. I mean, the story Um, that needs to be told is, is the flight of the disc. That's it. Like, yeah, you, you know, you you have the stories of the people and everybody can become fans of the person. And that's really, really important. But I think the thing that disc golf has that other sports don't have is the flight of a disc is in, insane. The things that you can do with it. It's not a golf ball that you, fl- you, you get it for like six seconds in the sky and you, and it looks like a little airplane up there and you can't yeah. even see it. And then it's on the ground. Like the entertainment value in, in golf is because you know how hard it is to hit a fairway. Okay. We got that. And then the anticipation for the putting is really what draws you in because you know how hard that is. And so you're like, okay, you know, the announcers do a good job of being like, okay, this is a left to right breaker, you know, and everybody who's played golf understands how tough that is. Throwing a disc down a very, very small fairway like hole four at USDGC is so difficult. And it's very hard to like capture what it actually looks like in person. You know what I mean? Like when, when we see it on Jomez or we see it on the network, it's just like, boop, boop, gone, done. I don't know how, what kind of camera we need, but I've seen it before on certain social media networks and stuff, certain commercials to where I'm like, wait, that looks a lot different than what we watch on live. Yeah. Like, let's get that camera to, to, you know what I mean? Tell the story. Um, it what we have is better than nothing, of course, and it's better than what we had when we were coming up, Rick. But mm-hmm. you know, it it always begs the question of of when can we get better, and and hopefully those guys over there are, are striving are striving to get better every year. Yeah, I think that's when we'll break through the plateau. Hopefully, yeah. Um, because I, I'm with you, Rick. Like. Right now, there's just a lot of people, and I get it too. Like the other thing that, and one of the reasons why I push for cuts, one of the reasons why I push for threesomes, one of the reasons I push all these things is because we got to try to compete with other sporting events. Like NFL is the biggest sporting event, and you can watch an NFL game in three hours and you're done. Some of these disc golf rounds are four plus hours. Mm-hmm. And it's asking a lot for someone to give up four plus hours on a Sunday or a Saturday. For sure. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it is. And, and, and so you're competing. Yeah. You're competing for their time, but you're also competing for potentially, like you said, if you ever want to get to that point, you're competing for the space that they already have and they're already doing really well. So it's like, there's, there's no reason if it ain't broke, don't fix it for those big networks. They're not, they're not even going to no. pretend to touch a sport like ours until we get, get the numbers up. And, and, and yeah, I mean, that, 
you know, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what their goal is. I'm sure eventually to get bought by somebody, you know, to where they can, the disc golf network wants to get to a point where they have good enough quality, good enough product to where they're like, all right, well, Amazon prime or whatever it is, yeah. can you know, buy them out and put them on a, give them the platform that we need to get the, take that next step with all the eyes that we, we think disc golf really deserves because of like what Yuli said, the watching a disc is just so, so much fun. And it's, even if you're not a disc golfer, it's, I, you always, you hear like beginners and people for the first time watching disc golf, they're like, yeah, a disc is so, it's so cool to watch because it's, it's in the air for longer. It can do more things. It can it's just majestic to watch a cool, like Heiser flip late flip disc fly. And, and, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's hard. It's because it's like, as you know, me and Yuli have always been on the, the player side of it and you too, Brody, it's like, yeah. so you don't kind of don't see the whole separate side. So I'm sure they got a whole separate side oh, yeah. of, of, of hurdles that they got to jump through that the reason why we're kind of stuck here. Um, uh, and you know, it'd be interesting to hear their side of the story just to see what, uh, what, what those hurdles are. All I, I think- know is I saw Matty O's ace on hole 14 on oh. Instagram. Yeah, that was the coolest thing ever. And then phone. I watched it on the network, and I was like, "Why didn't it look like the guy who filmed it with his phone?" <laughs> Thomas <laughs> Gilbert, I think, filmed yeah. it. Yeah, it was yeah. Like way Thomas better. filmed on his phone. It's way better than that anything we've seen. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens and 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 what how they move forward with everything because I, I, this is something too that I think needs to happen we need to start experimenting more. Like I I'm liking what they're doing with the baskets, right? We're like finally starting to do something with baskets. I like what we're doing with T pads. We're starting to do that. I think we need to start experimenting more with our, um, actual gameplay right now, like rules and all that stuff. Like let's figure out a way. Can we finish a round of disc golf in two hours? And let's just, let's just set up a course, set up what we need to do to make it to where we can film whole one to whole 18 in two hours and just see what the feedback is. Because if people are like, holy cow, that was incredible. Like so much action back and forth, jam packed in two hours and we're done. That was awesome. Then it's like, well, let's just try to recreate that. So you saying for the spectators, the experience for the spectators yeah, will be yes. better in person and watching it. Like, I think, I think we need to start trying to experiment with stuff and start trying to do different things to see yeah. like, Hey, maybe, maybe if this game, cause to me, like disc golf is not golf, right? Like yeah. you, no. you step up to a shot. There are people out there and, and, and this, this might be hurt some people's feelings, and that I'm fine with hurting people's feelings on this podcast. You can walk up to 99% of your shots in disc golf and know what to do before it's even your turn. Like someone else is getting ready to throw and you can walk up and within five, 10 seconds, know what you're going to do 99% of the time. You don't need a whole lot of time. And so my thought is like in golf, there is so much to talk about. The lie, the wind, the pin location, Terry, where, yeah. where the trouble is. There's a lot yeah. to fill in that dead air. And also you hear a lot of conversations between the golfer and the caddy. Very interesting. Disc golf, there's really not that. There's not a lot of that. And so my thought is like, what if disc golf became a much faster place, uh, faster paced sport? And it wasn't the... It, it, you know, and this is again, a lot of people, you know, get mad at me. Cause I'm like, I compare to golf a lot and I try to make golf disc golf. Now I'm kind of going the opposite. What if we don't go the route of golf of where people are taking 30 seconds to try to make a 20 foot putt? What if we don't go the route where people are slowly walking down the fairway to get to their line? Like what if we made disc golf a little bit more of a faster paced sport to where rounds were finishing in two hours and it's quick. Yeah. I don't know. Are we going to be running out there or what? Yeah, what, cardio, what are you suggesting? Some cardio? No, no. I'm just saying like if we, if we played in, if we played in like two sums or three sums, so you're not yeah. having a yeah. ton of people there. And, uh, and we made it to where again, like it, it is a pace of play thing of where you're actually enforcing it of where, Hey, there's a, a, a two hole gap in front of you. You guys need to pick it up, you know, or you just, I don't know. I, 
I, I just would love to see it. I would love to see what would happen from it. Cause there's just, there's a lot of downtime. There, there is just a lot of downtime. For sure. And I think you're going to run into those people that like, like you said, you're going to run into disc golf purists, which is, you know, is like that in every sport, people that have been around the sport forever. They want to see what, you know, disc golf is and in, in its purest form. And then you got these, like you said, the potential people that would like disc golf for some new revamped, you know, look for, Hey, this golf needs to be faster for the spectators. Me needs to be more accessible potentially for the spectators in like a certain, you know, courses, maybe smaller, like you said, to where you can, you can play, you know, a shorter course, maybe an all par three course where you're getting more aces. And instead of the par, you know, par fours and par fives on a lot of these courses that we have. And, you know, I think that's another big problem with disc golf is that we just go to these and it's like, we have these, and this happens a lot. We have these problems that like, like you said, with the camera work and the DGN that you can't, it's hard to solve the problem, but like, we're just stuck. It's stuck. It's, it's kind of like, Oh, you always hear people. That's how it's always been. So it's like, yep. as Brody, you, yep. I'm sure you've seen it in your time here is like, well, that's how it's always been. That's so that's how it's always going to be. It's like, well, no, that's not how, it, you know, that's not, that's not, the, that's not the right answer in my opinion. But, um, but yeah, just, we have all these courses like Jones brother out in the middle of nowhere. They don't, don't attract any people in person. And I think that that's something too, that we need to get better at as a, is, is going to more densely populated areas and establishing a, a course that we can tap into, you know, a Dallas, Texas or, a, you know, Los Angeles and, and really f- tap into that huge community of people that c- could potentially turn into disc golf fans and followers and players and all that stuff. And I think that goes a long way because a lot of our courses are in Jonesboro and they're in, you know, all these, you know, even Waco is not necessarily the biggest city, you know? So it's like, you know, you got these cities that just don't have big populations really to draw from. And it's like, yeah, you get these people that, you know, drive little ways, but like, yeah, one yeah, of our just best like, courses, Eagles crossing is like so far away. <laughs> yeah. Three hours from any big city. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah and, and then you have like places like LA where they just, there's a big city, a big population. They just don't have any disc golfers, none. Like there's no disc golf population in Los Angeles for as big as a city as it is. That's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, it's just such a weird demographic disc golf and it's just in a weird spot. Um, and you look at the big cities that they do have them. I mean, they're willing to drive a little bit. You look at Minnesota, they're willing to drive, you know, that hour from Minneapolis and St. Paul to go over there and watch a good show over here. You're 45 minutes from Charlotte for Rock Hill. We saw a huge turnout. Oh, I yeah. mean, they're, they're, those crowds were big. rivaling European yes. crowds they were for, sure. for the first time yeah. that I've seen in, in, in a long time. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the crowd right, at right. USDGC was quadruple oh. the crowd that we had at the world championships. For sure. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. Definitely. And it's like, if we could get that every week in a city like Charlotte, like, you know, that would be, that would be, you know, that would help everybody. It would help the, the you know, help the kind of like uh, what you call like frenzy effect is what I call it. Like whenever, let's say someone drops a new disc or something, you, all your friends are over at that, a booth and like, Oh, what's over here. And you get a bunch of people over there and they're like, Oh, you know, it kind of creates this frenzy of like, Oh, they, everyone's kind of got to go over there and see what's going on. Like same thing for disc golf. Like, there's big crowds. People are like, Oh, what's all these people watching disc golf, you know, in the videos, like it creates that frenzy effect. So if you had that happening every week and people constantly seeing that every week, they're like, Oh, that's pretty cool. Like a lot of people are doing it. A lot of people are paying attention to it. And then that frenzy effect kind of kicks in. And so I think that if we could have that week in and week out, it would go a long way for, for kind of creating this, the next generation of disc golfers that want to play the game and, and support the game. You got to yeah. have a good product too. I mean, the USCGC is just a great oh, place. So they, they, they have the, the, um, what do you, what do they call the place? Imagine if that wasn't arena, on a college campus. The Winthrop Arena. No, where Coliseum. they have all the um, selling oh. of all. It's oh, called Vendor oh, Village. Yeah, Vendor, Vendor Village. They have yeah. Vendor Village there, and that's freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. Guarantee this. Charlotte, so many people play. So many people came and watched. Guess what? We have a tournament this weekend in Charlotte. Guarantee there's not going to be as many people. True. It's true. It is true. Because the because the venue is just, you know, Nevin's just a cool course and all, but it's just a city watch. park. It's hard yeah. to watch. Yeah, you're just staring at trees. If I'm going there as a spectator, you're you're blind around corners, and you – you you watch the shot disc for five seconds and it goes around the corner and you're like oh whatever I don't even know what happened is he OB or in the fairway like it's not that fun the crowds at US were nuts I I left I couldn't watch I, you mm-hmm. couldn't get a good enough spot because there were so many people 
to, you you know, since I have my family with me, I'm not going to just leave them and kind of get through to get a good spot. It was like, it was crazy. I mm-hmm. think they, they have, they have the blueprint, right? They have the blueprint. You got to have a place where people can buy stuff. You got to have a place where people can eat. You got to have a place where people can play, right? They have those and courses. Drink. And so that way, if you go out there, it's like, all right, maybe I don't want to watch disc golf right now. Let's go play a little, let's play, play a couple holes. Like yep. you got to have something going on where, like you said, if you go to Nevin, your options are uh, peeing in the, tr- the woods or watching disc golf. Like those are your two right. options, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Like Literally, you don't, there's yeah. nothing else to do. Um, and, and just going back to the, the speed, the only reason I bring that up is because the two main complaints I always hear about live coverage is the quality isn't good and it's too long. I don't have enough. I don't have that time to watch. I'm just going to watch Joe Mez. It's 45 minutes. So that's yeah. the only reason I bring that up is like, what if we got around in two hours? Like, would more people be able to dedicate uh, the time to watch live if they know that's only two hours long? And I would just love to experiment. Have a tournament where there's 80 people, 40, 40 cards, two sums, and send people out. Everyone plays an hour and 45 minutes and just see what happens. Yeah. See I- how it flows. I, I think a lot, like what you're saying too, potentially, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud is like, y- if you had a different model, as far as the, you know, if, you know, people, cause people, you know, obviously lead card gets the cameras mm-hmm. and that's a guarantee. All you, if you're on lead card, you're getting shots, but like in between, in the meantime, like, you know, I think it comes down to the point where we need like, f- you know, three or four cards, the top three or four cards are going to get filmed like the lead card. So that way within those two, four cards, you're having, you're not having downtime where we're picking our nose, walking, you know, walking up the fairway. It's, you know, it's, Hey, we're going to go to, you know, whoever's in fourth, fifth, sixth place right now. And they're, they're throwing a cool shot. They made a cool putt. That's still entertainment value. There's entertainment value oh, there. Yeah. Like, yeah. It might not be, it may not be for the win or anything like that, but they made a cool putt. And it's, it's cool content. And so if you have more cameras, it doesn't feel so long. And I think it feels long right now because you have those big, you know, big t- gaps between us throwing the drive, then they may go to one card over and, and film a putt, but then there's still like this time they got to fill in. I think if they t- filled it in with more cameras, obviously that costs more money, and I'm sure that's why they haven't done it. Um, but I think that would make it feel a, l- a lot more fast paced and not so slow and not like like what you're saying and not yeah. feel like it's you know such a long drawn out round. You know, you're kind of like boom, all right, next next putt, boom, and you're kind of like you know everyone's attention spans real short. You know, so you got to have a putt or a nice you know long drive or whatever it is to keep that time going and keep that you know, that person watching entertained. And they're doing a good job too with like these fixed cameras. Like that was something that I suggested a long time ago of like, just get a camera on a hole and just film shots. Like they, they cut to it at some point in coverage. Greg Barsby wasn't even in the tournament to win. They cut to a shot on 17 cause he skipped it right off the top. Like he almost mm-hmm. ate 17. Cool. That's, yeah. We love to see that. Now this is, this is where I think Rick, uh, this is the big thing. We'll get off live. We'll get off coverage here in a second and go to something else. Yeah. But this is the big thing that I think is lacking. We need to have someone that can run the story because what you just said, we have enough cameras. The problem is they, a lot of times will just go live, 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 live. Oh, we have nothing versus it's okay to not always have live. It's okay to show something that happened 30 seconds ago because when Ricky's stepping up to that putt, that's 30 feet and right behind is water. I don't want to just cut straight to Ricky putting. I want to cut to where it builds a little bit. Give me a little bit of context around it and and how to get there. Yeah, correct. And like that doesn't always have to be live. And so that's where I think right now, whoever's running the show and doing the buttons and all that stuff, we're, we're missing out on like a good flow. We, we really are. And they'll, they'll show cup camp commercials at bad times. It's just, it's just not good. If you watch other live broadcasts and see how they flow, it can be done very, very well. Um, yes. no, Daniel, I watch a lot of live brother. I, I watch a lot of live and I'm telling you, they cut a lot of times straight to someone in a mid throw and you have no idea where they are. You have no context. 
You have no idea. Daniel, I wasn't on live coverage. I'm, I'm fine with someone in the chat. I wasn't on live <laughs> coverage, brother. I'm watching live. Ricky can't watch live because he's playing. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's, let's switch it. Let, let's talk. Let's talk a real quick. DG, uh, DGPT. I don't think I asked you this. We asked Calvin. I'm curious what your thoughts, you know, you, you've become the points leader. You've won this tournament before. What are your thoughts on the tour championship being a little bit less this year? $22,000 decrease in the overall purse. Did you see that? Did you have thoughts? The winner last year got 40 winner this year gets 35. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think that you know, kind of, it's obviously, you know, I think that's kind of just a sign that disc golf is kind of a little bit, you know, kind of tapered off as far as the COVID boom. So I think the money in it and everything and probably sponsors involved just probably didn't quite give as much money uh, as they did last year because last year was disc golf was kind of more of an up uptrend. Um, so I think that from that standpoint, that is what it is. And as a player, obviously we can't control that kind of stuff. Um, and then the second thing, as far as, uh, you didn't really ask this question, but um, I'll kind of talk about it, but is just kind of the, the point standings. That's always something that I always wanted to see as I would love to see that someone get rewarded for like what Gannon did. He played really a really good season and he got rewarded for it with strokes. Like he's going to have the, you know, a whole stroke over me and the whole two strokes over third and so on down the line. So I think that playing a whole season at a very consistently winning a lot of tournaments, which is what it takes to win the point title. You mm -hmm. actually get a, compensation for it basically in the, in a stroke form in the pro tour finals like this. So I think it's a really cool format that rewards the most consistent, um, placing player on tour. And, um, I think that's going to be, it's going to be a fun format. Like I said, it doesn't reset this year either. Cause I know in years past you would have yeah, strokes, reset but then after, reset after, yeah. like, after you'd make the, uh, the cuts or whatever. So, so yeah, I, I like that. And I, people are like, Oh, well, it's boring. Cause it's like the last place guys don't really have a chance. And it's like, yeah, I mean, but that's kind of the point. Like you have to strategically place yourself for this event to, um, throughout the whole season to it, you know, to, to get to this point. What do you think about this idea? We get rid of the world championships. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> get rid of it. And then the world champion is the pro tour points champion. I love that. I think Gannon should be the world champion this year, 100%. No. Nope. It's because not even close. He, he, he traveled across the world. He played all the events, and he's your best player. There's your world champion. Ex and, and then you no play the Pro Tour you. Championships, and he gets the points, but he wins that single whatever, and he gets rewarded exactly. with the compensation for that and the strokes going to the Pro Tour Championships. Yep. That's, That's what I think. exactly what I would love and to I, see happen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right, that cool. is, I, yeah. The I would other, love it. I just think that... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you go, you go. Um, yeah, I just, it's, it's always been weird to me, even, you know, whether I win it or not is irrelevant, but I, th I just always have thought that it's weird that you can have players and in that, that, oh, in, in, in any sport, really, like, I guess it's different team sports because you're, you're building up through the playoffs and all that stuff. Um, but I, I remember hearing Scotty Scheffler say something like, oh, if I'm hurt, you know, like the season he had, and if he was happened to be hurt for, you know, I don't even, what would you call the world championships in golf? I mean, they don't really have one, right? It's, I mean, they just have, see, that's the thing in golf is everyone has, there's a favorite. lot of players that have different opinions on what major is the most important to them. So there is exactly, a right. major out there that is everyone thinks, no, some people are saying the masters, but if you, if you were born in Europe, championship. if you're born in Europe, yeah. the open is the right. number one. And then there's some people that think the U S open is because it's normally the toughest challenge, you know? Right. So it's like, there, yeah. there's not a unanimous answer. Right. And, and I think that that's kind of like what it goes hand in hand with being the world champion. Cause there's no way to fudge that you're not, you're not just going to walk into a world champion and Isaac's well deserving. There's no take. It's not, it's not an argument about taking anything away from anybody sure. that's won sure. anything, but it's, it's like, um, uh, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't the best player in the world for the season for the 2024 season. He was the best player at the world championships. No doubt about that. But Gannon was the best player in the world. And so I think that every year in disc golf, sometimes 
you'll see people that, you know, if Gannon would have won the world championships, we still would have said, Hey, he's the world champion. You know, he did this year and he, you know, so, but he was the best player. And I think everybody in disc golf can agree with that. And so I think that that just kind of solves the problem of, you know, you know, maybe you just change the name of the world championships, like you said, to a different name. And then like what Paul said, you know, the world championship title is that person and that that one accumulated and then it would have to go back to we'd have to have a very legitimate point system that that really um made sure that we crowned the right person for that that season that was the most consistent week in and week out and of course it's going to come up you have to win events you have to and when you don't win you know that you have to place at a high level to to get those points and i think that that's like like scotty shuffler same thing when he didn't win he was in the top three almost every single time which is so impressive and that's Basically the same thing what Gannon was doing. You know, if he either won or he was in the top five, ninety-five percent of the tournaments that he played this year. You know, and so that's that's something that's really impressive as a player and as an athlete. That even when you had an off week, you found a way to still get inside that top five and not miss cash or get thirty or fortieth place. Like, you know, it's, so that's something that you know to translate how hard that is to a viewer is it's just like that with the competition the way it is and and everything like that it's you know it's very impressive and i think that yeah i don't know where we, if we'd have to go through the pdga to do that but i mean that's you know that's something that i would i'd love to see and it's but i don't think we will because it's kind of their baby yeah. you know and, yeah they um, don't want to get rid of that baby well i think it's interesting that the world's it might as well not even be a major like yeah. it's it stand it stands alone at so far and high above every tournament as far as like what you get, what uh-huh. your sponsors think you deserve, and all those things. Like, yeah, you you ask every single player like who, which one do you want to win? It's a world championship, and it's because it has the the name world championship on it. Yeah, uh-huh. it, com- it, okay. comes, and, it, it comes before the majors, right? You say you're a three-time sure. world champion, exactly. seven-time major champion. Yeah, exactly. In in golf, they don't have a world championship. <laughs> they have majors. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, and, and it, no, exactly. And it's like, like what Brody said, like, I feel like for me as an athlete, and the, well, I respect, I respect Isaac and what he's done the last two years. That's insanely impressive. But I also respect what Gannon did. Like that is so impressive to me that he just basically blew out everybody as far as the points go. Like, and that's because he's week in and week out just playing at such a high level. Yeah. And um, that's so. I respect that so much. And it's just like I feel like that's the title that for me as a player. Of course, I think I respect that more almost than a world championships. Of course, I want as a player. I want to win the worlds more. Because that, like what Yuli said, it's more monetary value and more recognition in a sport. But I think me as an athlete understands how how much hard, how hard it is to compete at that level week in and week out. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's what I have to say about that. Yeah. yeah otherwise, we'd be everybody would be like, "Oh, no majors. I'll take the Pro Tour Championships because it's thirty five grand." You know what I mean? It's like right, exactly. Which no, like, everybody, no, you take the major. The yeah. world championship one year could have five thousand dollars for first. Right. Every single player would be like, "Nope, I'd rather be a world champion." Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, if we're gonna blow everything up. Here's here's my big <laughs> here's my big idea because I like when the pro tour looks at the PGA tour and like takes ideas, but I think this was a poorly. This was one that they shouldn't have taken. I I could be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure the whole FedEx cup, the whole playoffs, the tour championship that was created because FedEx wanted to have something that was theirs. They wanted to be something. They didn't want to just get their name on a tournament. They wanted to create something that was theirs, right? It doesn't really work in golf. It really hasn't. No one's really, no one really likes watching the tour championship more than majors, right? Even though they are playing for 25 million or whatever, it might be 30 million, whatever it is. So this is what I think. You blow up the tour championship. You blow up the playoffs. The disc golf pro tour gets their own major. Let them have their own major. And they can, that can be their baby and they can do everything they want with that. Then you have a champions cup. That's their own major. And that's done by the PDGA. 
Then you have uh, the European Open, which I don't know what the name of it is, who runs it over there, but they do a great job. So that's their major. And then we just come up with a fourth major. Maybe we just have three majors, whatever. And that way (laughs) you just have something kind of for everyone and everyone can focus on it and do well. And you can get rid of this tour championship at the end of the year, these playoffs that don't really make sense because you don't even actually have to qualify to make it in the playoff. And if you didn't make it through people drop out and then you can take, it doesn't make any sense. Just blow it all up, give the disc golf pro tour their own thing. And then uh, see what, see what happens from there. Could be cool. Yeah. The yeah. Barbasol classic. There you <laughs> <Yeah>. go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I, I, to me, like I, I I'm with you, Rick, of where like we're at the point now where it's, if we just want to say, well, it's always been done this way. It's always been done this way. The growth of disc golf is it, nothing's going to change. It's, it's going to be a slow growth right. if any. So like at this point, it's like, why not try new stuff? Why not? Why not? And also like who made the PDGA, the one that like is the only one that gets to decide what's a major and what's not. <laughs> Like what if someone just, if if all the players just said, this is a major, this is a major, and this is a major, don't you think everyone would get on board? Uh, How many majors have you won, Rick? Yeah. All Uh, in all. I believe six or seven. So I think it's six. Six. Yeah. People don't care because you've won two world championships. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody could have guessed that. Right. If there was no world championships, people would know that you've won six. Right. That's you know true. what I mean? People mm-hmm. would know your exact number. Mm-hmm. If there was no world championships, we would know that Ken Climo won 73 of them or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. You know, Paul yeah. McBeth's 120. Or I think he's won six. I think he's won 16 and maybe Climo's won a little bit more or something. But that's my point. Like, mm-hmm. really what it comes down to, I want it to be equal across the top as far as an m goes why is one worth so much yeah well yeah and like you said even within that each major is worth you know a different has a different monetary yeah. value as far mm-hmm. as what it's worth to, to that person to that company whoever they're sponsored by all that stuff you know winning yeah. champions cup is way different than winning world championships or usdgc or whatever mm-hmm. you know like just as far as the amount of recognition, you know, yeah. eyes, I'm sure USDGC had way more viewers than champions cup, all that stuff. So you go all the way down the line and it's like, not, nothing against champions, champions cup, cup, but uh, who, yeah. Okay. He won a major. That's all great. Tiny storyline. I win the world championships. All of a sudden I'm a superhero. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why? But in golf, it has each major ha- within that major has its own storyline and own yep. reason why it's, you know, oh, a next major storyline. Next year's going to suck. Whoever wins the European Open, I'm sorry. <laughs> no right, one's, exactly, no yeah. one's going to care. Oh, no, exactly. Right. It's the weekend after the Worlds and people are still on the Worlds hangover. Like, yeah. No, I thought it was the week before. Is it the week before? I think it's the we week back before. Back majors. I think it goes, yeah, Euro- I think before, it goes European after. Open, then Worlds. Am I wrong? Either way, it's still. Oh, yeah, the- okay, yeah, we talked yeah, about we that. Is that. Is that right? Okay, I oh, thought it was on. after, but I mean, either way, it's probably someone not in chat will. Someone in chat will know. They'll tell okay. us. They're, they're, we have the smartest chat. We also have the trolliest chat too. So they sometimes get <laughs> it, sometimes get under my skin. But some someone will give me the right answer. But regardless, like someone's gonna win a major, and then no one's gonna care. Right. Which is just exactly. crazy. Like the, the, the crazy, better yeah. went back to back. That yeah, way. Yeah, that's yes. about the only way to solve <laughs> that, that problem. <laughs> that yeah. is the answer. That's where you go. That's where you go to the next level. And then oh. you play an elite series the weekend after that and definitely nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, no. No <laughs> like one a C cares. tier. Oh yeah, exactly. Oh man. Uh, um, but I mean that goes back to like what we're saying. I think it's the PDJ that's dictated that so long and it's kind of passed on to the just how we do things, man. Followers, because yeah, right. Because the C tier, like you know, the PGA classifies it as a C tier. But if it has you know a million dollars for first, and you get all the best players in the world, like I'm sure a lot of people would rather win that C tier than than the freaking potentially the European Open or whatever, you know. And you know, of course, everyone's got their own reasons. You know, yeah. if it's a younger, newer player that doesn't have much money, yeah, they might want to win that C tier because it changes their life. Versus a player like me, I'm like, oh, I want the M next to my name so I can add another major title to my, you know. If whether it's Champions Cup or European Open, you know, whatever, I want to just keep adding to my legacy, you know. So it's yep. 
it all goes to di- you know differently for different players. What you got, Brody? You, you get one week. You get one week to be uh, the European Open, and then no one cares. Yeah, okay, okay. World, <laughs> world is two weeks after European Open. Uh, at so least you the, get a little uh, so the, a week to go yeah, on. The week uh, after, the little... nothing's really happening, and then it's World's Week, right. and then no one, no one cares. Rick, I got actually, I got an interesting question because yeah. you have been so good for so long. You were in the Macbeth 2000, I think, 15 season where he won all five majors. He uh-huh. took third place one time in the season and then top two every tournament that he played. Yeah. Is that a better year than Gannon had this season? Ye- yes, I think so. Okay. I, I, it's close, though, I would say for sure, because just because the level of competition is it, it, that part is is there, but it's not. I think... Just from the eye test, I would say the putting them two heads up, Paul would beat them for. I can almost prefer sure. I would be very confident saying that. Um, but um, yeah, on a week in and week out basis, um, as far as the consistency goes, Paul definitely is there. Like it, he does, he never had like that during that season. He never had the the lapses where his game wasn't there. Like he was, he had, he had his, he was in his prime playing su- at such a high level every single round. There was no off days or off rounds. It was just, he just played at a high level all week in and week out. And Gannon still is like that too. It's just like, if you're off just by a smidgen at our level, you know, you get fifth or sixth, you know, where, you know, Paul was, you know, there was, there wasn't as many people that could take advantage of those mistakes yeah. and pass them on the leaderboard that day, you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, they're both incredible seasons. Um, and Gannon's been playing, playing a really amazing. He's just, yeah, he's just, he's a great putter. He's there's, he doesn't have any weaknesses. That's the biggest thing. He's, um, yeah, but, but Paul back, you know, that 2015 season was crazy. It was just like, you know, each major went by, he dominated, went to the next one. And it was just like, he just carried this momentum and this, he was just keeping confidence too. Obviously, anytime you play at that level, you got to be superior confidence to, to continue, continue doing that. Um, but that's always a fun question to ask is, but for me, at the eye test playing with both of them, I would put, I would, I would pick Paul for sure. One of the uh, things I think that is different between you and between Gannon and you and Paul, and I've heard this from players is like Gannon doesn't really have that same. It's different. It's, it's not when you and Paul played and even now, you know, I don't know if it's still, if people still feel with Paul, but people felt it with you. Like AB, we had him on. He felt it at chess.com when you made that putt on 17. He was like, he, yeah. he basically was like, I missed the next putt simply because of it was Rick and he made that putt, right? Yeah. So you and Paul have yeah. had this like energy around you that almost makes other people tighten up, make mistakes and mess up. Gannon doesn't really have that same energy. But like he's almost to the point of where it's like it's different because he's so good and so consistent. He's like you Scotty kn- Scheffler. You know he's not going to mess up, but yeah. he's like still like fist pumping people. He's still saying like, "Hey, great shot, man!" Like he's still like a weird. Like he's not yeah. this like you look at him because like when you're in the zone and you're playing well, like you're not talking to anyone. And people are looking at you being like, yeah, Oh my no. God, I have to try to beat this guy. What the heck? And it's like this like <laughs> right, different <yeah>. nervousness. <laughs> right. And with Gannon, he's just like, Hey, we're all having, you know, it's like, it's different. Um, yeah. I, I think, I, like, think like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Describe that to me. Cause you've, you've played with yeah, both so, of them on league cards. For sure. Yeah. I think that like, there's two different types of players. There's like players like, and, and and not necessarily one is not necessarily better than the other, but it's just how everyone handles nerves differently. But like Proctor, for example, he's the type of player where he just wants to go out there and pretend like he's a walk in the park throwing frisbees. He doesn't yeah. want. He just wants to completely disregard the pressure and try to just throw frisbees really well. And that's kind of his mindset, and that's okay. I think Gannon's kind of. Uh, kind of in that side where he's just out there throwing and he's really a good at throwing discs, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to get the crowd involved and hype and get all the kind of on this emotional roller coaster where he's feeding off the crowd, put, you know, you know, treating it kind of like a, and it's Steph Curry hitting a three and everyone going crazy, you know, like that's kind of, for me, it's, it's kind of a double edged sword. Like I like to get the play with the crowd, you know, play, you know, give them entertainment. They, you know, make, make a great shot. They, they hype me up. So it's kind of a, a win-win for everybody 
everybody. They get to watch a cool shot and a cool moment, and it kind of pumps me up, you know. And so I kind of play with the energy, and I I kind of crave that. So I know that if there's a big moment that I can try to capitalize on and cr- hype up that crowd, it hypes me up and kind of gets my uh, momentum rolling to where I can I can feel like I can play and really uh, use that adrenaline to my advantage. And then Gannon's kind of like, he just kind of keeps it low key, even keel. And he's just trying to throw that, throw the Frisbee in the park really well. And so he just kind of keeps that mindset. Like you said, he'll fist pump a little bit here and there. And he doesn't really necessarily throw, you know, um, get the crowd involved. He's just kind of more, more robotic type of thing. Yeah. And I think that's something that is, is on purpose to, to really keep him. And that's where he feels comfortable in that stage. Whereas me and Paul, you know, we're trying to, you know, trying to have a competition who can make that greatest shot and pump up the crowd. Who's going to make the, make the crowd cheer louder, you know? So that kind of stuff is, um, is just, um, how we've always been as competitors. That's kind of, um, yeah, just the big differences that, that I see for sure. And Calvin's kind of the same way. He's, he more wants to keep it low key and he feels more comfortable playing without all that added pressure from the crowd. You know, Ooh, like when he throws a bad shot or like super high, whenever he throws a good shot, everyone's just like, you know, okay. Like Calvin made a putt. Like that's what he's supposed to do. Move on to the next hole. Whereas me, it's like, Oh dang, Ricky hit a putt sweet. Like he wrapped her leg, ran it in there, you know, like, so it's just this different persona, I guess. And it's part of the brand, I guess, too, as well. It's not like it's all genuine with me where I just do it. And um, I genuinely was pumped to make that putt in that situation with that big crowd cheer. And, you know, so it's a genuine thing that kind of turns into my brand and people know me for that. And then I just start, you know, trying to use that to my advantage when I'm in a pressure situation. I want to hit that 30 footer for the win or, you know, on hole 16 to get that momentum on my side to where I can get that crowd hyped up and run into the next hole. Can't wait to watch how it finishes, you know? So all that's just kind of genuine emotion that I play with that not necessarily everyone plays with and not necessarily everybody wants to play like that. And that's okay. And I think that's, you know, just, you know, everyone's got their own brand and what they feel comfortable playing with that under those bright lights and high pressure. Yeah, no, it's, it, it is an interesting contrast between we're starting to see it a lot. And I mean, it's the same thing in golf. You know, you see a lot of players. Some are like the most boring players to watch. They're so good, but they're just right. They, they've just literally shut off their emotions. And some of them like a Jordan Spieth, like the dude could be draining putts from 30 feet and going nuts. And then yep. he could also be like hitting the ball off the map and like just being like, right. <laughs> what is happening exactly, you know right. and yeah, it's just yeah. like that roller coaster like people like seeing it but i think having the contrast yeah, i think if everyone was like that yeah it would be like way too much but having the For contrast sure. between players i think we're getting more and more like of those exciting cool players um that interact and stuff so i like it mm-hmm. i like it it's yeah. nice and it's more entertainment value too people get involved they feel like they're part of something you know it's it's, you know, as long as it's, you know, a genuine thing, they can, they can feel that and they really thrive off of that too. And they're, you know, really wanting to support, you know, those moments. Cause that's what, that's what live sports are all about. You know, Steph yeah. Curry, you know, when he hits a three in the playoffs, he's getting hyped up. Like, you know, he doesn't just, and of course he's made a million of them, but it's not, it's not, he didn't make a million of them in that, in that situation, with yeah. that pressure, you know? So he, um, as a player, you know, you, you genuinely have a response and then the crowd will react accordingly, you know? I think, I think one thing that, you know, we're talking about plateaus and how, how disc golf can grow. I I actually, again, we have to get there and that's the hard part. Like, how do we get there? But I think once people start becoming more well off and they're not so reliant on disc sales and they're not so reliant on their image and they're not so worried about what people think about them, then I think people are start, will, will start coming out of their shell more. I think, I think we'll start seeing it. We've already seen it with some players that are more willing to talk about stuff that maybe they weren't in the past because they got guaranteed money coming in. Um, that will be interesting to see how the pro tour, if like all the top 30 guys are well off, like they've got money. And so they're not worrying about, Hey, do I, do I want to show emotion here? Do I want to get upset here? Do I, they can, right. they can kind of be a little bit more free. Cause I think there are a lot of people, like you said, there are some people that are calculated. There are some people yeah. that are like playing a character and not able to really show what they want to show because of outside factors. Right. For sure. Yeah. 
and they have a persona to kind of live up to and they don't, and they want to hold, hold true to the brand. They're not genuine with whatever they're, you know, whatever they're feeling at the moment, they kind of just put on a front and they're just like, all right, this is probably what's best for my brand. So this is what I'm going to do, you know? And like you said, it kind of, yeah, you can't blame them for it, but also it's kind of like a product of, like you said, what disc golf, the the culture is and you know, where people are at just in their life in general, you know, but for me, I've always just been genuine is always better. Whatever the genuine response is, is what I'm going to do. What do you think the craziest thing you've done after a shot or putt? Can you, can you pinpoint Um, one where you're just like, that was kind of, that was kind of out there. Yeah. I remember the green mountain tournament. I remember I kind of let that and started running down (laughs) Down the the fairway. fairway. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That was a little excessive for sure. No, I loved Uh, it though. I loved it. I know some people got mad at you for that, but I'm like, I'm like, Uh that's sick. Like I've never seen someone sprint after their disc down the fairway like that. Like a dog. I thought that was cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It was kind of like, I don't know. I, I was obviously a little overboard. My adrenaline got the best of me, but at the same time it was my natural reaction. And it was just like, I would, you know, I always told people it's, I threw a drive that, you know, of course, you know, the way the tournament played out, I think Dickerson went out of bounds. Yeah. So I knew that that moment was, Hey, if I throw it in bounds, the tournament's over, it's mine. Like that was the moment that shifted to me. Of course I wasn't cheering that he went out of bounds. I was more cheering that situationally the way it played out was he threw it out of bounds. I threw it in bounds. And I won the tournament basically right there. Like that was the moment where I won the tournament. Just like if you were to make a 20 footer for the win, it's the exact, pretty much essentially the exact same thing. Of course you have to have the respect to play out the hole. And, but, um, that the, all the emotions came out then instead of the potential 20 footer, like it normally would. And that's why I did that, you know? And, and so, yeah, it was just weird. Cause it was a drive and people kind of thought, Hey, the tournament's not over yet. And it wasn't, of course I knew that, but I just knew that that was a big moment and I showed it. Yeah. Love it. All right, Rick, do you yeah. got, uh, you got anything for the people, any disc, any merch, any uh, announcements, anything like that coming out? No, nothing too crazy, but yeah, I just posted my YouTube video for the last, uh, the pro tour finals video. So I've been doing that and that's been a, been a great thing. So if you want to check that out, we'll look, take one more, uh, lesson into the off season, check that out. And, um, thank you guys for having me. It's always fun chatting with you guys and, uh, yeah, can't always, wait to be back soon. Always fun. Are you, what are you one, two shots back from Gannon? Yeah, one. So he's ten. Uh, I'm nine. So it'll be a fun right. battle. Nice little battle over at Nevin. Yeah, if you're luck. Uh, good luck for the thirty spectators that are going to watch. Enjoy it. Oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, good good luck out there, hey, Ricky. If you park hole one, I want you <laughs> sprinting you. after it. <laughs> really put the fear <laughs> in the kids right. early. Before the disc lands, I'll be at the disc. <laughs> All right, brother. Oh, appreciate you, man. Have a good buddy. one.